It's a national icon, an engineering masterpiece, and a war winner. For a decade, the Spitfire lit up the skies. The British Spitfire had proved to be one of the deadliest weapons ever put in the hands of man. Now it's more popular than ever. They just stand for courage and victory and all those kind of things. And at one of Britain's greatest wartime airfields, it's being brought back to life. There I was sitting there in amongst a 12 grand lump of wreckage, basically, but feeling quite pleased with myself that I now own a Spitfire. Over the course of nine months, we'll be following this small team of engineers as they rebuild Spitfires. There's a wobble pump. Explore their history. Gosh, look at that. And give veterans another chance to fly. Uh, wonderful. They'll be using many of the same plans, tools and methods as their 1940s counterparts. I've got to warn you, there probably will be some banging, clattering and... Oh. And scouring the planet for as many original components as they can find. I want 15 grand. But they're on a budget, they're on a deadline. We've got to do it today, otherwise um, we look like a bunch of idiots. And those planes have got to fly. Welcome to the Spitfire factory. This time, at the Spitfire factory. It's all hands on deck as the team take on the biggest build moment of the whole Greek Spitfire restoration. Whoa! Whoa, back up. One of the last planes shot down in the Battle of Britain re-emerges from the earth. You can actually smell the petrol from 80 years in the ground. It's quite strong now. And veteran pilot Archie McInnes tells his incredible hurricane survival story. I reckon I died there. Now I'm waiting to go the second time. <laughs> the Biggin Hill Heritage Hangar attracts thousands of visitors each year to its spectacular collection of veteran aircraft. All restored, or at least maintained, by owner Peter Monk and his team, including a 1940 Hurricane and a Luftwaffe ME109. This flies slow, that flies fast. Then you think, actually, which was the better aeroplane? Experts struggle to agree which World War II fighter was the best. But it's the iconic status of the Spitfire that keeps Peter's business rolling. And their main build for the year is about to take a huge leap forward. For the last 17 months, they've been working on a two million pound restoration of a 1943 Mark IX owned by the Greek Air Force. Now the rebuilt fuselage and wings are ready to be reunited. It's obviously good for the customer to see the aircraft coming together and uh, putting big lumps on, like the wing, is um, obviously good visual progress and good for morale. You need to lift the front end, put the, the jacks underneath the fuselage and it's quite heavy. Chief Engineer Franco is taking charge of what is the single biggest operation of the entire build. that will do for that. Connecting a fragile half-ton wing with the freshly painted fuselage. We're now going to go down to the back end to lift the back end up quite high to get that trestle in. It takes quite a few of us to do this because it's quite heavy. Ready? Go. If they can get the fuselage at exactly the right height and angle... I think it's just the floor. ..the wing should just slot into place. Whoa, 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 oh, whoa. Go back down. Go back down, go back down. Bolt's falling out. And off we go. Up we go again. Pins in. That one is, that one isn't. Meanwhile, Gary is making final checks on the wing. Anything that isn't secure is either going to fall out of place or fall on the floor or get caught in fingers, so... Just make sure everything that is there is secure. Unusually for a Spitfire restoration, this is the original wing, with only a few newly built parts. It's taken ten months to restore. A Mark IX Spitfire can perform 5G turns at 400 miles an hour. But under the skin, just eight bolts hold the wings on. Seven at the front, onto frame five of the fuselage, and one more bolt at the back, attaching to frame ten. And on this restoration, even some of the bolts will be originals. Peter came across 
a box of, of these rear spar bolts. Um, and you can see they're not being used because it hasn't got any drilling of split pinning and they were covered all in wax oil. So, you know, that's, that's a ministry made old bolt. Just making sure it's a nice fit in the hole on the wing. And then it's also a very nice fit on the fuselage. Right, shall we get this wing on? So what we're going to do is we're going to lift it up, get rid of the stand, flip it over, slide it in. Already at the back, actually roll it on this trestle and leave it on it. The moment of truth. After months of work... Ready? In. Will it actually fit? In a bit more. Wiggle it. That's it. Whoa. Whoa. Back up. Apparently not. Do you want to get the jack under? So it's got some... Down a little bit more. Go up. Hold it there. Everyone in the hangar has stopped what they are doing to lend a hand. Even Peter. But it's just not lining up. Whoa. Wiggle it out. Yeah, we're coming out. Take the jacket out. A tiny sliver of the skin is snagging. We're just going to slide the, the wing back out so we can just trim the skin so we can get the wing all the way on. It's not quite, it's just a fraction. Wiggle. Yes, it's coming. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. It's loose when you take the bow out. Bit more, bit more, bit more. Hold it there. Steady, Franco. Thought this was precision engineering. Good. Yep. It's in. One perfectly aligned wing. I've taken some good photos, so um, I'll send those off to the owner and they should be happy. Bring on the next stage. It's a big step forward, but there's thousands of parts and thousands of hours' work still to go. And this Spitfire needs to be flying in just four months' time. Peter's collection of original spare parts is vital to his restoration business. And sometimes he has to go to extraordinary lengths to beat the competition. Today's arrival is an entire container of parts that he's bought from Australia with very little idea of what he's actually getting. This is not the first time that I've had a container load of stuff that I've never seen and paid a lot of money for, but um, I have to do it. It's a $100,000 lucky dip. It's nearly always paid. I say I nearly said always there. That's not quite the case. We've had one or two uh, disappointments along the way, but um, it's been a net gain, so it's always been worth it. Hello, what's that then? Ah, it's an instrument panel, is it? I don't know. There's some useful bits in there, I can see. There's a, a booster coil used to start the engine. But I like the key in the sweet shop when you open the back of a truck up that's full of Spitfire stuff. Brake valves, which operate the, the brake system. That's the, uh, that's the control column. I wasn't expecting to see that there. That would be worth a couple of thousand quid all day long. A Spitfire contains about 7,000 individual components and Peter collects all of them. It's a flap selector, which is very rare, and it's collectible to the um, mantelpiece collector, if you like. We would like to collect that just to put it indoors. Well, it's worth at least a couple of thousand quid. You could make one cheaper, if it, but it's not what we're about, so we need to collect all this original stuff. Don't drop it. Don't fill your pockets up, Richard. I'll be checking them before you leave tonight. Now he's struck gold. This is Peter's most valued part of all. Undercarriage legs are the main issue, really, for any restorer. Propellers we've got round, that's been an issue in the past. Now it's undercarriage legs, so I want to make sure that we're secure with what we've got. There are very few spare in the world. The guy that's collected these has been collecting for 30 years or more. These parts come from over 600 Spitfires that were sent to Australia during the war. The Japanese were causing a bit of a nuisance in, the, uh, in, in northern Australia 
and uh, the Mark Fives especially were um, defending the country. That bit of nuisance began with Australia's version of Pearl Harbor, a devastating surprise attack on Darwin on the 19th of February, 1942. It was the start of a concerted 18-month bombing campaign. But Australia's outdated fighters were no match for Japanese Zeros. So, in June 1942, three Spitfire squadrons were dispatched from England and began the fight back in August that year. A BTH made NATO. Containers full of Spitfire parts don't come on the market very often. And Peter's gamble to snap it up looks like it has seriously paid off. Got it, Richard. Right. We go over here and I'll stand it up next to the wing. Overall, I'm very pleased with what we've got. But he's now got days of work to sort it all out. Although most will never be used in restorations, prized among Peter's exhibits are the remains of crashed aircraft. Tour customers can't get enough of the stories surrounding those crashes. Now, this engine here, you can see it's slightly what we call shop soiled. The engine went 25 feet into the soil when it came down in 1942. The engine weighs three quarters of a ton. So you can imagine when they came down, it was like a bomb going off. There's hundreds of them still out there. In the UK, most crash sites date back to 1940, when over 600 Spitfires and Hurricanes were shot down in the Battle of Britain. Since the 1960s, a few small groups of die-hard enthusiasts have been digging them back up. And today, this lot are looking for one of the very last planes still in the ground. At a secret location in Kent, a local farmer has given permission for an excavation. Dig organiser Gareth Jones, an archaeologist from South Wales, is hoping to find a 1940s hurricane. Battle of Britain digs, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't happen that often these days of MRIs. Most of them have been dug up. Um, and this is one of literally only a handful that's in accessible conditions in, you know, in a farmer's field. So we're very lucky to get, obtain their permission. He's joined by veteran digger Steve Vizard, who has unearthed over 100 Spitfires and Hurricanes in the last 40 years. This is actually a site that I came to, uh, must be very early 80s, and so it's, it's good that um, today's generation of researchers and fixers, you know, is going around still investigating the ones that were never fully, thoroughly examined all those years ago. Historian Robin Hill has a strong hunch exactly whose plane crashed here. I was looking into crashes, and one of them was this, uh, this aircraft, and I wrote to the pilot, who was um, still uh, around at that time, and uh, he sent me a, a reply, which surprised me, because he, you know, it was very generous of him, detailing exactly what had happened to him. That pilot was Desmond Fopp. On the 10th of September, 1940, FOP was cornered by three Messerschmitt 110s, hit from below and bailed out at 17,000 feet. He landed in a tree with his toes just touching the ground and his uniform was still smouldering. And he was, a farm worker came up to him who thought he was a German at first and gave him a couple of prods with a pitchfork before uh, FOP managed to convince him with a set of fruity language that he was actually uh, British. He was then taken to hospital where he began weeks of intensive care and rehabilitation before rejoining his squadron later in the war. Before they dig, a powerful metal detector is used to map out the site. Now this will actually pinpoint the epicenter of the crash. Uh, this will pick up uh, metallic objects only, so such as the engine, undercarriage legs, all the steel parts. From the signals, there's obviously a substantial piece of steel there. You might expect archaeologists to arrive with trowels and brushes. But for these guys, this is the tool of choice. They've been given just one day to access the site and they want to retrieve as much as possible. Top prizes would be parts of the cockpit, the engine and the registration plate that could prove that this was indeed FOP's hurricane. As the digger makes light work of the topsoil, Steve's daughter Vicky is on the lookout for telltale signs 
that they'll need a more gentle approach. And we are just keeping an eye out for um, what we call um, crystals, which is corroded bits of aluminium. Um, they'll be bright blue white crystals, and that will tell us where the main part of the airplane is. Just a few feet down, parts begin to emerge. Just a typical piece of hurricane structure with all the struts going into um, a joint there, and then there's a uh, stainless steel bracing strut down there, which is uh, sort of typical of, of the hurricane construction, very different to a Spitfire. They're not looking for metal skin, because unlike the Spitfire, the hurricane was mainly fabric covered, based on the earlier biplanes it evolved from. This is the rudder bar and rudder, rudder pedals that the pilot had his feet on. So at the bottom of the pilot's control column. So we're in the cockpit. The deeper it gets, the more excited they become. Being a Spitfire restorer means turning your hand to all sorts of different tasks. <clears throat> Today, Gary's doing the plumbing. I've been given the task of installing all the hydraulic pipe work. All right, so these are the... I've pre-cut these lengths roughly to where they're going to be. We shouldn't have too much wastage, hopefully. Um, comes in a coil, so it's not particularly straight, so we've got a, a great little tool. Takes all the bends and creases out the tube, so it gives you a nice straight bit to play with. Next, Gary has to prepare one end of each pipe so he can attach them. Very accustomed to this type of work, quite comfortable with it, really. The hydraulics in a Spitfire have one simple role, retracting the undercarriage, which is crucial to the aircraft's aerodynamic performance and speed. A pump powered by the engine feeds high-pressure oil through the fuselage to the controls and to the undercarriage. So these are the original hydraulic pipes off the undercarriage. They are extremely pitted. The outside wall of that is starting to corrode very slightly, as we all would do after 80 odd years. Gary wants to use as many original parts as possible, but not these. A lot of the stuff we are reusing, the skins and the instruments are great, but when it comes down to the, the hydraulic pipe work, because of the pressures it's operating under, and obviously it's operating the undercarriage, the wheels, it, it can't be compromised with. So if there's any any signs of failures, corrosion, then it's a straight replacement, no questions. Right, so I shall get myself back in my rabbit hole. Not so easy for a man of Gary's stature. So he's had to give the Spitfire an extra leg. Well, if it wasn't for the hole in the floor, I would be probably laying down or kneeling on some of these frames, which the hours you're putting into the pipe work is, is just so uncomfortable. So here you've got your undercarriage selector um, and all this pipe work here, which continues right up through to the undercarriage rams. I can't allow the pipes to be touching each other. Obviously, um, there's going to be vibration. Um, if there's any chafing, eventually there's going to be a wear. You're going to, or they're going to wear on each other, obviously, a chafe marks. You'll end up with fractures and then you've got hydraulic leaks and then you've got failures. It's fiddly work in a very tight space. And Gary's not about to be let out any time soon. At least a week, ten days, sat in this little little hole, making sure it's, it's all perfect. In the Battle of Britain, about 2,500 fighter aircraft and nearly 3,000 pilots defended the country against waves of German bombers and their escorts. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost. Spitfire is the best remembered, but they were outnumbered two to one by Hurricanes. Both had their own strengths, and both played their part. Spitfire factory historian Robin Brooks is a big fan of the Hawker Hurricane. Well, this is a Hurricane. In the UK, there are only about seven or eight Hurricanes flying. It is a tribute to Hawkers that these are still flying. I, I think the Hurricane is a lovely aircraft. Developed at the same time as the Spitfire, it was bigger, heavier, and a bit slower, but a steadier gun platform. Mainly that the Hurricane hit the German bomber stream. That was the idea, whilst the Spitfires looked after the escorting fighters. 
99-year-old Archie McInnes, one of the last surviving members of Churchill's few, swears by the hurricane. All the time that I was in the RAF, yes, I flew a number of other aircraft, but the hurricane is the thread that goes right the way through. You had the whole feeling of flight. There you had an aircraft that was responsive to what you asked of it. You make the movements and the aircraft reacts to it. So it is part of you. All of it coalesces into a love of the aircraft itself. I can see why Archie loved it. It was a hurricane, really, that, that carried the Battle of Britain. Um, it could take more punishment than the Spitfire could because from here up to the tailplane is all fabric. Now, that meant it could take severe punishment because the bullets would just go through the... straight through the fabric, it would land, they'd just slap a patch on it, and up she'd go again. It was solid, stable, and did anything that you asked of it. Aged just 21, Archie flew his first sortie on the 9th of October 1940. Oh, look at them. We were all so, so young. Combat is a funny thing because you're up against another aircraft. Um, you can't see the pilot. You certainly don't know him. Um, so it's just an aircraft that's got to be shot down. And if you can, that's what you do. There was an element of fear. Scared of what might happen. At that scared, more scared in the sense of not doing the right thing. But there was nothing personal in it. You were up uh, each day sitting in the hut. You flew, went back, came up the next day. It was just a job. The Spitfire was another aircraft. I had a hurricane. I never thought about uh, whether they were better than mine. It didn't enter into it. <laughs> With his 100th birthday coming up, Archie has been invited to the Spitfire factory to fly in a two-seater Spitfire. I understand that I'm going to be taken in a two-seater Spitfire, but I'm over six foot, and a cockpit, to say the least of it, is cramped. <laughs> Down at the hurricane dig, there's a welcome pong in the air. You can actually smell the petrol from 80 years in the ground. It's quite strong now. They're now deep inside the aircraft, and the treasures abound. This is the bottom of the, the gun sight, and if you hold that up to the sun, you can still see the cross, the graticle, the gun sight itself. The last time Fop looked in here, he, he was shooting at Messerschmitt 110s. This is the spade grip off the top of the control column, the piece that the pilot would actually hold. That's the, the gun button. But they still need proof that this really is FOP's hurricane. They need the data plate, if the Earth will give it up. Time for some precision digger work. Whoa, 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 you go. On that. Yeah, it's on that, isn't it? This is um, historically significant. This is the main aircraft data plate, and this is where Hawkers actually put the aircraft construction plate. And on here, when we can get it cleaned up, if we can get it cleaned up in the field, will be the aircraft serial number, which was P3673. The P3673. P3673. So on here will be confirmation that this is Fox aeroplane. The trouble is it's got very hot and it's in not very good condition. But I don't want to be responsible for, for breaking it in any way, shape or form. We'll have to take this home um, and it will have to be cleaned up in a sort of more controlled environment so that we can actually expose the number and conserve it. A minor setback, soon forgotten 
as a battered 1940 Merlin engine is released from the soil. And so here we actually have the Hurricane engine and you can actually see along here we have part of the Rolls-Royce and badge on there, which is great. When the engine has been cleaned, it will become a piece of forensic evidence, helping the team reconstruct the last few minutes of this aircraft's life. We found probably 75% of the cockpit components, which is always nice to have, but it can all be put on display so that people on the 3rd of September 2020 can actually see what happened here on the 3rd of September in 1940, telling the pilot's story, but the history of that day, um, you know, what could be more fitting? It'd be fantastic. It's been a hugely successful dig. But back at the Spitfire factory, there's bad news about Hurricane pilot Archie McInnes. At Biggin Hill in Kent, the Spitfire factory team is making great progress on restoration of their Mark 9 Greek Spitfire. And they're looking forward to the visit of one of the last surviving Battle of Britain Hurricane pilots. But Robbins had bad news. Archie has been taken ill and can't come for his two-seater flight. Would you like to sign Archie's card for oh, me? I'd love to. All right. Here's the card, which says, Happy Birthday, Archie. After all, it is his 100th birthday. So we are now going to go around the hangar and get all the signatures we can, and then it will be sent to Archie in the hope that it brightens his day. Age brings too many problems. I don't recommend it. Can I ask you to sign it for me? Absolutely. In your own head, I'm not 100. I still feel mentally back there somewhere. Lovely. Thanks, yeah. Paul, very much indeed. Yeah, lovely. Right, anything you want on there. Archie came through the Battle of Britain unscathed, but on the 30th of October 1941, his luck ran out. After the Battle of Britain, the squadron moved over to North Africa, and Archie was in a ferocious uh, dogfight. A 109 who was coming in on my left. I never saw any other, but I turned in on him, hard left, climbing. He overshot and I had him over on my right-hand shoulder and turned hard over to him. And it was just behind him when his number two opened up on me. I could feel the armor plate taking all, and I was hit in the back. There was more in the cockpit. At that point, I knew that I was going to die. And with acceptance of that, it was as though everything was lifted and I was free. And then I blacked out. There was a little bright light in front of me. As it expanded, I could see a hand was undoing the straps and as it expanded out I saw that it was my hand that was doing it and uh, eventually got my helmet off and then I stood up and I was flat on the ground and the aircraft uh, had broken in front and it had broken behind Archie lost an arm in the crash, but he has little doubt why he didn't lose more than that. A uh, spit would have broken up, almost certainly. I don't think I would have survived that. The hurricane, <coughs> although broken, the particularly the part that I was in, was still in one piece. So in that respect, I have to say, I think it saved my life. While Archie was grounded, he helped design his own prosthetic. And in 1943, he returned to the skies and kept on flying until the end of the war. I've said it only once before. I reckon I died there. Now I'm waiting to go the second time. <laughs> At the factory, Alex has been picking through the shipment of Australian Spitfire parts. So this funky little thing, the very British, 
piece of equipment and it's a wobble pump. So if I, if I do this, that is the best noise you could hear from one of these. And it sounds like a pig, I know. But what it is, is it's got a diaphragm in there and it pumps fuel through. And it's a hand fuel pump. The one on the Greek aircraft, unfortunately, is, is damaged beyond repair. There's no repair in it. It's corroded really heavily inside. So between the remote contactor, so the big black bracket at the back, and the Morse code tapper, the small round black object in front, there's a bracket. So it goes right here, because this has been an earlier Spitfire, it doesn't have an electronic fuel pump like most do. It's a nice piece. Perfect for this old girl. In Wales, Gareth Jones has been busy cleaning up his haul of parts from the hurricane dig. I'm trying to dig some of the, some of the clay. It's obviously burnt in, because obviously this engine would have been baking hot when he went in the ground, so you can almost turn to it like a brick. A piece of the conrod, which would have had the piston at one end and the crankshaft at the other, well, half a centimetre solid steel, forged steel, and it's just, just snapped. The, the forces involved are incredible. Gareth's being helped by Battle of Britain expert Ian Hodgkiss. And the cleaned up parts are giving up their secrets. We had a little wash up. This is the, this is the oh, main Hawker. Hawker place. Aircraft Limited. The Hawker Aircraft. Uh, there's the serial number, the drawing number. You can just see in there P3673. So we, that actually confirms it is Desmond Fops Hurricane. It was actually manufactured the 24th of April 1940. That actually confirms this hurricane for us. This is a very unique find. This is the pilot's auction connector. You can actually see FOP engraved on it. Oh, there you go. Good uh, grief. FOP there. Very pleased with what we found. We said we've got the Rolls-Royce main engine, we've got the propeller hub, pilot's control column. We've got the main plate that identifies the plane. So in terms of a, of a dig, you've pretty much got all you could ever expect to find, really. Yeah, you go home smelling of oil. It's 80-year-old oil. Being a hurricane, none of these parts are likely ever to fly again. But Spitfires are another story. At Biggin Hill, Peter Monk has adorned one of his factory walls with the wrecked remains of a Battle of Britain Spitfire, which, as crazy as it may sound, might well fly again. What we're looking at here are the um, remains of a Mark I Spitfire uh, carrying the serial number P9372. This was actually shot down during the Battle of Britain on the 9th of September 1940. It took off out of Biggin Hill and was involved in a skirmish over the English Channel. The pilot successfully bailed out uh, and landed with just minor injuries and the aircraft found its way down into the area of Rye and uh, crashed into fairly soft soil down there. 80 years of, will have passed, but the aircraft has survived. Doesn't matter which, which way you look at it, here it is. We're going to put P9372 back in the air. While none of the structural elements can be used, many of these parts can be included. Here we have the gun sight dimmer screen mount. If there were the aircraft flying tracers or fly, flying in dusk or otherwise, to stop the, the flashing, there was a tinted glass that could be pulled up in front of the gun sight, and it was held by this bracket here. So it's something that would have been handled by the pilot at the time, and, uh, and we will use it. The parts Peter plans to use embody the history of this plane, sometimes in extraordinary ways. Here we have the, the tail wheel of the aircraft. The tyre is in remarkably good condition. The inner tube is still inflated, so I'm not actually squeezing air from 1940. So. There we go. And we're going to leave it in there. We're not going to extract the air and reuse it. It's going to stay in there. So we've a long way to go. We've started the process of collecting parts for it, all period 1940 parts. We're saying that we should be able to do it in, a, in about two and a half years. It's an important project for us. It's the only surviving aircraft that took off from Biggin Hill in the Battle of Britain. If there's a way that we can put one of these back in the air in this area, in the county of Kent, where this all happened, then that's very important. Mm. 
On the 31st of July 2019, Archie McInnes celebrated his 100th birthday with his friends and family. A few hours later, he passed away, peacefully. Yeah, we're all here to commemorate and remember Archie McInnes, so it's a tribute and memorial to, to him and his incredible life. Well, growing up, he was one of my heroes as one of the, the brave fighter pilots who flew in the Battle of Britain. Um, and I was privileged enough to, to get to know him in the last few years and be able to call him a, a friend as well. So not many people get to meet their heroes and he was one of those that, that I did. I think it's an understatement for a chap who uh, was generally quite a quiet guy, uh, very humble, uh, quite modest uh, and a lovely guy to have as an uncle. He was one of uh, Churchill's few and we're here today both from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, which obviously commemorates that, and George and myself from 601 Squadron. At the time Archie died, there were just five other Battle of Britain pilots left. They were an amazing bunch of people, uh, and where would we be without them today? As a final tribute, the aircraft that Archie knew and loved so well is here to send him off. A Mark I Hurricane. For many, the Hurricane is the forgotten hero of the Battle of Britain. Archie was one of almost 3,000 pilots in Spitfires and Hurricanes that defended our shores. At the Spitfire factory, Alex is starting work on the job he's been looking forward to from the start assembling the Greek Spitfire's instrument panel. There's quite a few different gauges in the Spitfire, all telling you very, various bits of information that are all important to the role that you're doing. And so the one I've got here is a voltmeter. It literally just tells you how much voltage is in, in the aircraft's battery, the wire on the positive, the wire on the negative. Oh, well, wow. it's about 24 volts. But despite being sat in a packet for 75 plus years, it still works. But I've got an original fuel tank gauge, and so that will go in the instrument panel, as well as a couple of other bits and pieces here as well, like a, another, an RPM gauge. Inside the cockpit of a Spitfire, there are over 50 different gauges and switches, all needing their own connections to the aircraft's electrical, hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Installing them all is a very delicate process. I want to be careful not to kick and scratch everything. First we've got the RPM gauge will sit up here and I've got to make some spaces so it sits at the right level but it should be flush with the front of the gauge I mean the front of the panel like that. That's quite an important gauge so it sits quite high up in the pilot's face. In here is a, another panel that's on spring mounts so that the, the instruments in there are very fragile they don't get damaged. So RPM gauge there and then below there goes the boost gauge like that, which will sit about there. We just make sure I haven't put it upside down. So there'd be the starter here and the booster here. And they used to talk about um, starting a Spitfire. You used to do the V for victory because you need two fingers. So you go like that, hit the booster and the starter, and then release the booster and hold it on the starter, and then the engine coughs, and then yeah, into life she goes. There'll definitely be a good couple of days' work involved in it. You don't want to rush it because it's the, like I say, it's the the first thing you really focus on when you get in an aircraft, and it's something you spend a lot of time looking at when you're flying them. So um, you want to make sure it's right. There's one man who will have a special interest in Alex's work. The last British pilot to fly this Spitfire when it was delivered to Greece in 1947. Ah, beginning to look more like an aircraft now. Eh? 96-year-old George Dunn. I can't believe they got so far ahead with it. A few weeks after they discovered his connection to the aircraft, he's paying a visit to check on progress. It's ground crew chief Ray's job to make sure he has a very special day. Outstanding guy. Um, so I'm really, really happy he's here. He's fit and well, and uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be getting him up flying today. So, do you want to go and have a look? Yeah, we'll have a look up. We'll have one up. 
Yeah. I'm loving that wing. Well, this is the what is this the universal wing, wasn't it? Yeah. The universal wing where they had the cannon ports and the yeah, well, machine gun ports yeah. as well. I, I just um I just can't believe that he's got on with it so well. I know, it's going, it's going yeah, all right, yeah. isn't it? When it came over, did it virtually have everything? Were there any parts that, uh, uh, you there, know... Yeah, it... there's some, there's some, but when you look at all the, the towel that's gone on, all the ailerons, all the fuel tank covers, all the, all the cowlings, all yeah. the... All, all for the rad covers, what, what, they're what, all... What, what about the small stuff? There's yeah. a lot of the stuff on the shelf is the small stuff. Yeah. Even the mirror's gone on, look. Yeah. Rear view mirror's gone on. Yeah. I think, to be honest with you, George, I don't think it's going to fly again, mate, because there ain't no room to put a second wing on. No, well, we're going to knock that wall down. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely marvellous. Round you, George. Oh, yeah. Inspection yeah. complete. George has taken up an invitation to go flying. Right, well, this is what you've got to do with a Spitfire, George. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Peter, Pete Kenzie is your, your pilot, all right? Here, sit down and have a chat with you before you go up, all right? Let you know what you've got to do and what you can't do. So, you can't do a takeoff and landings and you can't go upside down. All right, here, do that bit and you can do the rest. All right, <laughs> you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. You, you get your hand on a stick and fly it. Yeah. It's just ridiculous that 75 years later someone's telling them how to get out of a Spitfire in an emergency. Just uh, don't seem quite right, really. George. Hello, Very nice mate. to meet you. Meet you. Hi, yeah. <laughs> Look for, looking forward to it. Yeah, we're going to go and have some fun in the Spitfire. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> For us, flying these aeroplanes is a fun thing to do, that's why we fly them, it's almost a sport. But for people like George, it was anything but that. He went off on missions, he knew he might not come back, his friends and colleagues might not come back. It's a completely different thing, and it just makes you realise how lucky we are not to be involved in something like this. Yeah, all yours. When's the last time you did this, George? 73 years ago. I'm real, isn't it? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Ugh, 73 years ago, you sure? Jesus. You okay? Yeah. Of course, of course you're okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. George, you have a good time. All Thank right. you, mate. All right. Thanks for your help. Really enjoy it. All yeah. right. George, can you hear me okay? Yeah, fine. Can you hear me? He was looking at everything that was going on in front of him. He wasn't looking around us or anything else. He was looking at what was going on, what the gauges were doing. You know, he was, he was back there, wasn't he? Instincts, I should think. Just instincts. Seventy-three years later, George Dunn is back up in a Spitfire. And at 2,000 feet, he's offered the controls. I asked George if he'd like to fly it, and he took the controls, and within a second you could tell you were sitting with another pilot, because he instantly went back to flying exactly the same way as I'm sure he did 70 years ago. It's a bit like uh, riding a bicycle. You never really forget the basics of uh, flying. Came back. Yeah. Never thought I'd never thought I'd experience it again. But there you are. Yeah. Very grateful to uh, those that made it possible. Yeah. It's a bit warm in there, Ray. Any good, George? Right. 
They wanted you to keep your helmet on. What do you think about that? Ah, oh, wonderful. Wonderful. The flight was a bit too short. I could have done with a bit more practice up there. <laughs> Today really brought it all back. And when I got that stick in my hand, uh, really felt great. If you want to take that away with you, George, that's for oh, you. That's for me, is it? Of course it is, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. It's a day I shall remember forever. I hope God. so. It's been, it's been marvellous. Next time, Ray goes to meet one of his 1940s counterparts. And the petrol dropped into your eyes. They leak like a sieve, don't yeah, they? We used to say it made your eyes sparkle yeah. from when you went out at night. The Greek Spitfire team races to reach another major milestone. On Monday, I managed to get a slot in at the paint facility on the airfield and um, paint the wings. And everyone at the Spitfire factory is counting down the days to the biggest event of the year, the Biggin Hill Air Show. With their Spitfires due to take the starring role. The show will then culminate in a single solo display by the Spirit of Kent. So see if it gets fixed up in time next Monday at 9 o'clock. Now, Wednesday at 9, in the tale behind a legendary lineage from strength to scandal in the brand-new series The Kennedys, Tragedy and Triumph. Next tonight, Guy Martin's building a World War I tank, because of course he is. <laughs>